No. Uh, where did I say that midterm cuts off, I think, 14-2? Is that right, 14-2? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're going to think of a, we're going to do the lowest dimension we can, which is, that's not one dimension to one dimension, so we're going to go two to one. So we'll take some f going from, I'm already not on the lines. <laughs> I'm not a between the line type of professor. Two to R and two. So we're gonna think of a surface graph. So what is a surface graph? It is the set of points x, y, comma f of x, y, such that individually x, y is in domain of f. So that's basically just a graph of f right there. Now f is two-dimensional input, one-dimensional output, so the graph has to be three dimension has to be exist in three dimensions. Uh, the graph itself, generally if you have a smooth function, will be a two-dimensional surface. So I will do my best to draw a random surface here in three dimensions. Always dangerous to draw three dimensional objects. So it's supposed to be sort of like a piece of paper, kind of bent a little bit. Yeah, falling, maybe a leaf falling, something like that. So it's some sort of like top of a hill, but a rectangular cutout of the top of a hill. Well, it's got more bend than that. So I'm just going to take one point on this. I'll basically kind of pick the center point. And we're going to look at uh, what happens as I move along. We got the x-axis and the y-axis. If I move parallel to the x-axis or along the direction of the x-axis. So what type of shape will I trace out? It'll obviously be a one-dimensional, not quite a line. It'll be a one-dimensional curve. And if you look at it at the right angle, it will be a line. And if you look directly above, it will look like a line. But it will have some bend along the uh, surface. And I can do the same thing along the y-axis. And that's going to look something like that. So we got our x-axis and y-axis directions. So any questions on what I'm trying to draw? So it's sort of you're on top of a hill and if you laid out some grid, latitude and longitude grid, it would be these lines right here. These lines would be part of that grid. So we're going to look at now tangents. So we're going to look at tangent lines in these two directions. So tangent line in the y-axis, along the y-axis. Now it depends on which way you're going, but tangent line doesn't have a direction. So let's say that tangent line will look something like that right there. And I'll call this Ly, so the tangent line that goes along the y direction. And we can have a tangent line also in the x direction, of course. And that's going to look maybe something like that, and that'll be LX. So we got a tangent in the y direction, tangent in the x direction. These will have a, these lines are orthogonal. If you sort of look at the right angle, you'll see. Actually, if you look at the correct angle, you'll see the right angle between the two tangent lines. Obviously, it doesn't, qu it doesn't look like a right angle here, but I think you can imagine you'd have to sort of lift up the view a little bit and look more downwards, and you see the right angle.
So we'll give coordinates for this point right here. There's obviously one special point right in the middle that we're using for both lines. And I will, let's mark off some values here. Oh, so this is where 3D is really bad. I decide what X and Y coordinates are in use here. So let's go with that X coordinate. Maybe that Y coordinate. So there's the point X not Y not, and then we're supposed to be directly above that. So whatever Z value or F above that point right there. So if you forget about the Z coordinate, this is basically X not Y not. If you just say, hey, forget about the Z coordinate. Or right, maybe we're in three dimensions, so I should probably give this a third dimension. So I'll go X not Y not zero. So that's the point down below on the XY plane. So of course, what is this point up here on the plane has the same XY value. So this point right here will be x not y not comma take x not y not and f it. So it's f of that x y value right there. So that's the point on the plane that we're using. So you have two lines that are clearly intersecting at a point. They're definitely not parallel. Two lines that intersect in a point form a plane. You can just think of two pencils, however you hold them. The only time they're not going to form a plane is if they're parallel. But if they are not parallel, they don't even have to be orthogonal. But certainly if they're orthogonal, they're super clear. So they make a plane. So their plane that they make is called the tangent plane. I think my marker is too thick. Looks like I'm doing graffiti. Right, that's a little better. All right, so that's change of plane, and that's visually what it looks like. Now. Let's get the slopes of these two lines. So we'll do the x first. So how do you think we'll get the slope of LX? Derivative. Oh, very good. Derivative. Now we have to be careful. We, we have a function. Here's our function. Let's see. So we'll begin with f of x, y. Now we say take a derivative. There's two variables we can take a derivative with respect to. So let's think about LX. Does Y change at all as you move along the LX line? No. Nope. So if I ask what's the change in Y in that direction, the answer is there's no change in Y. It's zero change. Y is not changing at all. So I need an X derivative is what I need to do. So what happens when X increases? That's what happens when we go sort of out of the board. Oh, I should point like this out of the board, or what happens if we go into the board? That's the what happens when x changes. So we're going to go with an x derivative of the function. So our derivative definition is limit h approaches 0. Now I'll write the good old days definition over here.
All right, so that's the definition from calc 1 when there's just one variable. So obviously our function needs to eat two things, not just an x. So pretty obvious h is on the bottom. And that would be f of xy. Now what do I need to f right here to get the analogous? There needs to be something plus h. Which variable do I want to add h to? So I want to think change in the x direction. So I need to move a little bit in the x direction. So it's going to be f of x plus h comma y. I want the same y coordinate either way, but my x coordinate is going to move a little bit. So that is the partial derivative definition right there. Now another thing that changes, we don't use these d's anymore. We use a curly d. It's the same one, according to your textbook, that is for the boundary. So it's a backward six, basically. So we're going to write it like this. So this is a partial derivative with respect to x. Now, if you want to know what the full derivative is, you can skip forward a few sections and read that. But we'll get there at some point. So we do partial baby steps first. So slope and x. In general, you want to go with parameterized lines. That's really the only way to do it in higher dimensions. So I'll just write a uh, VT plus P naught. I think those are some letters we used. Use V for the vector direction of a line. I probably used the letter M also before. All right, so we know the general form. This is what a line is going to look like. Now I need to get the right vector. What point do I need? Do I already have my point? Yeah, it said X naught, Y naught, and then F of X naught, Y naught. So I got my point already. All I need to do is worry about the direction. So my V is going to have three coordinates. And let's think about which ones are not going to change. How much are we going to go in the Y direction as we go across this line? None or zero. So zero is the middle coordinate for sure. Now let's think about our slope that we got. Well, it's not really the full slope. Slope's not a good word to use for lines. You want to talk about directions. So let's think about this x derivative of the function. So what this tells us, this tells us how, let's see, I'll rewrite. So f of x, y is really the z coordinate right there. That's what we use, uh, the output of the function, we use the z-coordinate. So this is dz dx right there. So this derivative we computed tells you how z changes when x changes. How does x change when x changes? One. One. So that's good news. That one's easy. So when x changes, how does x change? It changes the exact same way. So if your x went up by 2, your x went up by 2. It's a little silly to think about, but dx dx is always going to be 1. And you're taking a derivative with respect to itself. So we've got a 1 here. And how does z change? The answer is whatever I get for this derivative right here. So this will be dz dx. That is the direction of our line. Oh, we also have to evaluate it at x naught, y naught. That's classic calc 1 mistake. Linearize your function and not actually plug in your value for slope. So that better be a number, not some function of x and y. OK, so that's our v. We already know p naught. 
So we could plug it all in now. One comma zero comma dz dx. Actually, I'll leave it. Uh -oh. Let me leave it as d dx f of x y evaluated at x not y not. So you're going to see that notation. It's the concepts are actually in general easier than the notation is to understand. So notation can be kind of tricky. That's why we're going very slow through this. So we got times t plus, and I know p naught was x naught y naught, and f of x naught y naught, and that's lx of t. That's pretty ugly right there. So another way you could shorthand it is mx, the slope in the x direction. So you can also use mx for that. All right, what am I going to do next? Yeah, let's do ly. So we'll start the same way, slope of ly. So what derivative do I take of f? Yeah. Only one choice left, y. All right, minus f of x, y over h. So most things in math are analogous for x and y. So what, what does f need to eat, the first f? Yep, and second coordinate, y plus h. All right, so that is dy, uh, d dy of f. And of course, you can call it dz dy, and we'll be lazy and call this my. It says the slope in the y direction. So we are using the same p naught, the same point, but our slope, our v, is going to be very different than it was before. So let's look at v. So I want you to take 10 seconds and try to figure out what the analogous v should be. Try to get as many of the three coordinates as you can. And the picture might be helpful. We're looking at ly now, the not quite horizontal one, but the one that's not going out of the board. Your line equation is a y instead of x. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, it sure does. Anybody want to be brave and share their vector? So there should be no x change, right? It's not coming out of the board or going into the board. And then how does the y coordinate change when the y coordinate changes? One. And now z, that's going to be that partial dz dy now. Or you can, yeah, write it as my. Z D Y evaluate it at X not Y not. All right, so we got our both of our equations here.
So it can be a pain in the ass to write ddy, ddx, all that stuff. So d, d, x. fx and so we use a subscript to talk about derivatives now which is completely different before that little prime notation was a superscript so I don't know why we went from superscripts to subscripts when I say we I mean people who made decisions 80 100 200 years ago why these ideas were good but, but it's what they are and we're going to use them now, I only talked about a function that had an x and a y input, but a function could easily have x, y, z, w input. So I can do our function only had x's and y's, so that particular function doesn't make sense to plug in uh, to find a z derivative. But you could have z derivatives. Whatever input variables you have, you can take any of those derivatives. Yeah, your, your tangent will have the same number of dimensions as your, your graph does. So when we had one-dimensional curves, your tangent was a one-dimensional line. Right. So, so if you have a... So if we... So if we have a two-dimensional, we'll get there. So we have a two-dimensional surface, like a regular surface, your tangent... Uh, will be a tangent plane. You now, if you have a three-dimensional uh, object, your tangent will be three-dimensional. So whatever your now, in general, you're talking about a local dimension uh, because our functions will be nice, so they'll generally have the same dimension no matter what point you're looking at in the in the graph of that function. Uh, so we won't really have to worry about different dimensions, things changing dimensions. So we're going to do the x derivative first. When you're taking an x derivative, you are treating everything that's not x as constant. So we're taking an x derivative. So what we're going to do is treat y like it's just a number. So when you take this derivative, all non-x's are constant. So you can think of it just like a, a number like pi or 3 or whatever number you want to think in your head at that moment, or you're just going to write it as, uh, as y. So y is constant here. y is not changing. What rule do I need to do to take this derivative? Quotient rule. So there is a x stuff in the top and x stuff in the bottom, the denominator. So I need a quotient rule. So I might be insulting your intelligence, but I don't want you to mess up quotient rule just because we're sort of doing new stuff here. Now, you're taking x derivative. So I'll do the first part of the quotient rule. So derivative 2x is 2 times y plus cos x. So I just did derivative top times bottom minus 2x times some stuff divided by cos x squared. All right. So go ahead and write the, in this case, v prime. So you're taking the derivative of the denominator, but with respect to x. So y is a number.
derivative questions. The only tricky thing is all your non-x's are constants. That's the only new thing that's happening. So it's a little weird, but the x derivative of y, this is not implicit differentiation. That's why we use a different d. Implicit differentiation, I would get a y prime, or a dy dx. Now in this case, y is not, uh, y is not changing um, at all. So that would be 0 in this particular derivative. So it could be sometimes confused with implicit differentiation. So take this y derivative. Is that marker good enough to read? Yeah? OK. All right, so now all non-y's are constant. So all you really have is x and numbers. So those are all constants. So you still need, you could do it without a quotient rule if you wanted to. But you'd have to write it like times that denominator to the negative first power. But just go quotient rule. It'll seem more reasonable. So in some sense, this derivative was a lot easier because the numerator derivative is 0. So it's much simpler. So we talked about two dimensions, functions that ate two-dimensional variables. So in higher dimensions, your function goes from n-dimensional space to one-dimensional space. So if you look at the inputs, now, if I knew n was 3, I could go x, y, z. But if n is a larger number, you might run out of letters. So what we're going to do is go x1, x2, xn. So however many there are, there you go. Most of the time, it's going to be two or three. Occasionally, there'll be four, but it probably won't go past four. So that's what your input looks like. So we can ask for the The x ith derivative, which starts to sound a little silly. And this is for any i, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, up to n. So any integer i from 0 to n. So we got the partial notation on the left and then the lazy notation on the right. Just has f with that little variable right next to it right there. And now I'm just showing you there's a subscript of a subscript. So it's a little annoying to write that out.
I just had a Freudian slip. So in one dimension, if f is differentiable, it's also continuous. So every differentiable function is continuous. So we prove that way back in Calc 1. So if you know your function is differentiable, your function has to be continuous. Now, that required, we only proved it in one dimension. So we didn't prove it in two, three, or four dimensions. We didn't even, we only learned about differentiable or partial derivatives 10 minutes ago. So we certainly didn't prove it in any dimension other than one. So I want to know what is the x derivative at 0, 0 and the y derivative at 0, 0. Yeah. So this function is a little tricky right here. Let's see. Now, the uh, conditions for 0, let's look at the conditions for 1 the second part right there. So where, where is xy, the product xy equal to 0? X or y is 0. When x or y or both are 0. So if I graphed in two dimensions, the actual axes that I just darkened in have a y value of 0, or I should say a z value of 0. And the everything that's not on the axes have a z value of one. Does that make sense? I'm just drawing the domain right here. If you want to think of a surface on top, or I should say a surface on top right here, if you're on the axis, your height is zero. So you're on the board. If you're not on the axis, your height is one. So it's gonna be one unit out from the board. I'm going to try to draw this in some cool three-dimensional stuff. So you're sort of having these infinite blocks. They're one unit tall, but they're infinite, infinitely big in each quadrant. And our height is zero on the axes themselves. Can't really draw the rest from that perspective. Oh, I can cheat and do this. Does that sort of give you that idea? A little, I try to draw height one blocks sort of sticking out of all the quadrants, but then we're zero height in between. That looks weird. All right, hopefully that makes some sense right there. All right, so let's think about what does the partial derivative at zero look like? So the partial x derivative at zero. So we're at zero, the origin. What happens to the height as I move left and right? Would it be like that this is like when x times y? Ah, yes. Let's fix it. Uh, my picture is amazing. So we got zero, one, there we go. All right, so we're on the x-axis. How does the z-coordinate, or the height, change as I move along the x-axis? Or does it change at all? It's always 0. So that is 0. There's no change in z, or altitude, or height as I move on the x-axis. What changes if I move on the y-axis? How much does the height change? 
Nothing. Zero. Oh, those are some nice derivatives. Nice partials. Hey, they both exist. I could have done this with definition of derivative as well. It would have worked just fine. It would have been pretty boring because it would have been like some zeros minus zeros over h. So it would have been super easy. Cancel out to zero. All right, so we got two partial derivatives. They're both about as nice as you can get. Is this function continuous at zero? So let's talk about paths. I know I have to remember way back to yesterday. So what if I have some paths? So let's do our first path along the x-axis. What altitude are we approaching? What height are we approaching when we go towards the origin on the x-axis? Zero the whole time. It's pretty boring, right? Let's take the diagonal path right here, the y equals x path. What height or altitude are we approaching right there? Yeah. Remember, not, e not at the origin, but what is our altitude or height approaching the origin in that direction? So one the whole time. There is a drop off at the end, which means this function is not continuous. So there is a drop off. So lim fxy as xy approaches 0, 0 does not exist. So we got a function that is, has nice partial derivatives, but is not continuous. So why do we go through this example? Because this says in two dimensions, this function has derivatives, but it's not continuous. I would like this theorem to be able to remove the reliance on one dimension. I want to say in every dimension, if f is differentiable, f is continuous. So what that means is this idea of differentiable, we're going to have to work on that a little bit. So we just found it's not enough to look at two partial derivatives. So we're going to look at strengthening differentiable, the definition of differentiable in higher dimensions. So that's what we're going to do on Monday.